If you want to support these projects, head over to mulliganbrothers.com where you can now buy the Inspire Change t-shirts and much, much more. And please consider becoming a YouTube member with the join button down below. Before that, let's jump into the highlights. So just for a description, what is an IED to, to the average person who, who wouldn't know? How would you describe an IED? So IED stands for Improvised Explosive Device. And that's exactly what it means. It's improvised, so it can, it can be anything. And in this particular situation, it was an anti-personnel mine which is only designed to, to blow off a foot. The idea behind them is it will maim somebody and then when everyone else goes in to help them, you know, the enemy will usually pop over the hill with AK-47s and wipe everyone out. So it was an anti-personnel mine. But on top of it, they had put the warhead of a 107 millimeter Chinese rocket, which is like a show launch rocket, which will take the side of the house off. So I stood on the warhead, the warhead put pressure on the mine, the plates in the mine touched, the mine erupted, the warhead erupted, and then I erupted. And the only thing I can think of as to why I'm still alive is the angle that it got me at. If it went straight up, it literally would have incinerated me. There would have been nothing left in my body. But I can only think that because we're in a bowl, it, it came at an angle and it took me out at like a 45 degree angle which is why everything here is untouched and still intact. It was just, I put my right arm down to get onto my belly and it just took off both the legs and the arm. So um, you're in the, you black out in the, the helicopter, you wake up um, in a military hospital. Did you get taken to, was it like a temporary hospital or was it like something yeah, like that? Well, so I'll tell you what was insane about the whole thing in the back of the helicopter is, you know, they checked me for a pulse, they checked me f to try and put fluids in me, they couldn't. They put an oxygen mask on me, which should have steamed up, but it didn't. So that's why they said, okay, this guy's dead, leave him. Now, when one of the medics walked past me to get some equipment to work on the other guy, he said that my eyes started to flutter, which meant my heart was still beating. So he alerted some of the other medics, they came back. And three days before this incident, whoever is in charge of the, the army medical field had given the green light for this new technique to be used, where if you can't get intravenous lines into somebody's veins, you drill into their tibia and fibula and you put the line in there. So that's what they wanted to do to me. Problem being, my tibias and fibulas had been ripped off by this IED, so they had nothing to work with. Now, through their quick thinking and, and their courage, they thought, okay, we'll try his hip bone. So they drilled into my hip from the front and back, they put a line in, they said the first time that the skin was too loose so it didn't bite. So they pulled it, they tightened it, and they put it in again. And they said the second time it bit, the fluids went in. And within like three minutes, they said I was back and I was awake and I was responsive and I was answering their questions coherently. I wasn't babbling, I was actually giving them legible answers. So they flew me back to Camp Bastion um, to the temporary field hospital that was there and the surgeons that were working that day had a look at the damage caused by the IED and, and it was a, a mess. And they decided that the only way they were gonna be able to save my life is if they took off both my legs above the knee and my right arm above the elbow. So at, at that point, what was the, was you conscious? Was you, so at, at what point did you wake up and, and start to have a realization of the situation? So I, like I said, I passed out when the Chinook landed and I woke up uh, four days later, on the 28th of December, in Selly Oak Hospital in Birmingham, in intensive care. I woke up for about 15 seconds, um, and then just passed back out because I was exhausted. And then the, ne the next point was after, was that, would you have been after surgery? And so what they did in intensive care, they, they kind of reduced the medication to bring you out of the coma. And I woke up for that first 15 seconds and was, I couldn't even open my eyes. I was so exhausted and then I blacked out, but they kind of knew then that I was, not that I was okay, but that I was making progress. So then they started reducing the medication, they brought me out of the coma, and then I spent seven days in intensive care, each day spending more and more time awake in the real world, reducing the medication, so that I could gradually understand where I was, what had happened, and, and the severity of my injuries, and, 
you know, they did it perfectly. You know, it wasn't like I woke up cold turkey and was like, where am I, what's happened, and started freaking out. It was like a gradual drip feed, day by day over the, the course of a week, where initially I thought I'd lost my feet and some fingers, and by the end of seven days I realised it was both legs above the knee and my right arm above the elbow. Once you'd had that realisation, you'd been able to come to terms with the situation, what was your, what was your initial mind like? like where, where was you at in your head? Um, initially, I wasn't in a good place. You know, I was 24 years old. I was, at that time, six foot two, 16 stone, physically, I think, at, at my peak. And then I woke up in hospital and I'm like four foot three. Because of losing three limbs and the, the infections I was fighting off, I was probably eight stone 11, I think. And full of tubes and everything. And I also had a, a huge hole in my hand from a shrapnel wound. I could only use two fingers and was just, lying in bed thinking that's all I could do and initially I was not in a good place but I had incredible support around me you know from my family from the Royal Marines all the doctors nurses surgeons everyone around me just kind of came together to to get me through those initial couple of weeks of, of dark thoughts and, and hardship and it worked out, you know, it worked out in the end. How, how do you go from being in such a negative place and, and dealing with a trauma at the exact same time as well and turning it into a positive and starting to turn that around and, and start to work on your own mindset and your own mentality? I think in the beginning, there was a lot of kind of falseness between me and the people around me. It was almost like false positivity. You know, if I was feeling bad, I would act like I wasn't. And if, if they were struggling, they would act like they weren't. And it, even though it was a little bit false, it helped. And it, you know, just trying to force a bit more of a positive atmosphere kind of really helped. And then three and a half weeks into it, uh, a doctor walked in. He wasn't part of my team, I'd not met him before. And he told me he was the, the UK's leading professional in the field of amputations, like for 33 years at that point, he had been amputating people's limbs, following up their progress, and he was like the UK's guru. And he came in and said, I have never met anybody in my 33 plus years who's got one leg missing above the knee that has any success using prosthetics. So you need to start mentally preparing yourself for life in a wheelchair. And you've got to imagine, I've, I've come from like alpha male, peak to now at 24 years old in my mind thinking I need carers people to wash me people to feed me you know push me around in a wheelchair and you know that's really not what I wanted to hear at that stage I'm three and a half weeks into my recovery so that sent me into a spiral and you know I don't mind admitting this I, I contemplated suicide at that point but about a week later I got an unexpected visit in my, my hospital room and a guy knocked on the door and he came in and he was wearing two prosthetic legs and he was a double above knee amputee like I was he had both his arms but he, our legs were very similar and he sat me down and he talked me through his journey he had been hit by a suicide bomber in Iraq in 2005 he talked me through the journey of getting from the hospital to, to getting prosthetics to regaining your independence and what it was going to take and you know some of his highs and lows and after about six hours, he left, and that was it. My, my mindset was changed because I had physically seen somebody who had achieved what I wanted to achieve, and then it didn't matter what you told me about how you couldn't do this and couldn't do that. I, I witnessed it with my own eyes, someone else doing it, which meant to me there was no reason at all why I couldn't do it. And, and I knew I was missing the right arm, that was my dominant arm, but it didn't matter. You know, I, I saw this guy had done that, I listened to what he told me, and from that point on, I was like, there's no way you can stop me. Give me the legs, give me the rehab, let's go. What was the goal in your mind then at that point? Um, after seeing him, what was your goal? I, I set goals very early on, and this is what I attribute a lot of success to, is having goals and something to focus on and drive towards. And my goal was when my unit came back, because they were still in Afghanistan when I was in hospital. My goal was when they came back and we had our big medals parade at the unit with all our friends and family in attendance, that I would 
wear prosthetic legs. You know, it wasn't gonna be pretty, but I was gonna walk onto the parade ground and stand and get that medal. I didn't wanna be in a wheelchair with people pitying me and feeling sorry for me. And so I instantly, after, after meeting that guy, Mick in hospital, set that as my goal. And then I got out of hospital after six weeks, got straight to rehab. I couldn't jump straight into prosthetics because of the scars and, and the wounds that I had, but I worked on everything else. I started working my core and all the other muscles I needed to work to be able to walk my glutes, hips, lower back, strengthening those day by day, getting stronger, making sure I was eating the right kind of foods. You know, rest wasn't a problem because I couldn't do much else but rest and do a little bit of physical activity. But having that go was massive because, you know, you get up in the morning and your back hurts and you've got blisters in your groin and you just, you know, you're exhausted and you don't want to do anything. But having that go and the thought of failing that just drives you, you know, and I didn't want to, in my mind, I didn't want to let anybody down. I wanted to go up there, stand shoulder to shoulder with those guys that I fought with, make them proud, make the wider Royal Marines proud, make friends and family proud. And so that was it. Like when I felt sorry for myself, I just always went back to that girl and thought, this is what I'm doing it for. Let's keep pressing on. If you want to support projects like this in the future, guys, we cannot do this without you. We cannot get our film crew and myself to fly around the world without your support. So please head over to mulliganbrothers.com where you can now buy the Inspire Change t-shirts and much, much more. And also, please consider becoming a YouTube member with the join button. All your support literally makes this possible, so thank you. Um, if you want to see behind the scenes as well, head over to Instagram, follow me at Jordan Mulligan Brother, where you can see what I get up to on a day-to-day -day basis. Have a blessed and productive day, and we just want to say, the whole team wants to say, thank you. Sincerely thank you for all your support. Um, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.